probably well with the chat. Okay, Bob, we are now live. Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to, to this meeting of ACIT. Uh, for those that are with us remotely, can you see who they are? Okay. Yeah, I've, I've got a list of who they are. So it's, it's okay. Good. Well, in that case, we'll start with start on the agenda and go to our approval of our uh, November meeting minutes. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? Anybody want to move? Uh, I'll move. We can't okay. Move. So Dennis moves. Do we have a second? Do we have a second? John Warren second. John Warren a second. Okay. All, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks. Okay. E-File Texas update. Tyler. So I'll turn it over to Terry. So uh, Terry Derrick with Tyler is here. And so Terry, I've enabled screen sharing. So I'll let you drive from your computer if you're game for that. Can you hear me, Casey? We can. I'm sharing my screen now. Okay. My screen. All, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Thanks. Okay. Hey, whoever, somebody's watching the YouTube stream. Oh, wait, no, it's me. Hold on. <laughs> this is second, Terry. Okay. okay, Terry, now you can go. Okay, thanks for that, Casey. Um, okay. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody uh, and, and uh, being here today and then allowing us to, to speak as usual. Uh, we'll, we'll run through just a few program updates. And then if you have any questions, then uh, we'll address those um, as we go along. So uh, continue to see the volume look, look good across the state. Uh, you know, we're processing now about 800,000 uh, 800, envelopes every month. Uh, you know, and our user counts continue to grow and they're, they're over north of, of half a million users. Uh, out of the 515,000 filers we've got, it's only about 22,000 or 22% uh, of those uh, filers are registered attorneys. Uh, so we see a, a large number of filers come on board and then um, use the tool and then uh, move on. Um, what's interesting to see in that is, uh, you know, their SRLs or self-represented litigants that uh, come on board and use uh, the tool and, and maybe only use it for a small amount. Um, they, they do make up a large portion of the registered users, uh, but they do make up a small portion of the filing volume. I think it's south of 10%. So uh, interesting to just kind of watch that. We'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in just a minute when we go into the e-filing analytics uh, as it is, it'll allow us to, to dig into some of those metrics and, and details at a letter at a more granular level and find out some of that information. Um, as it pertains to not only uh, county by county, but office by office. Uh, just a quick update on our automated certificate of service that um, you know, has, been, has been out for uh, a, few, a few months now, a few quarters, I believe, um, but we're working on the development work to be able to identify when uh, we have that be applied based upon the type of filing. Uh, so we'll have the ability to remove it, which I believe is one of the requests uh, for certain documents like proposed orders. And so that'll be a part of our dev cycle two uh, for the eFile Texas 2.0 project, which we'll give an update on here in just a minute. But moving in that direction so that if there are certain types of documents that we need to remove uh, that certificate of service on, we, we should be able to do that here in the near future. Uh, one update uh, that was interesting since our last meeting was the increase in utilization on re redaction. So uh, it's been used more than a half a million times across the state, but since December, we've seen uh, about a 62% increase. And so we're seeing about 7,000 more utilizations each month uh, than we saw at the end of last year. Uh, we're not really sure why we're seeing this increase in utilization. Maybe the, uh, the, the filers are just using it more frequently, um, but something that we'll continue to watch uh, as we progress on this year. Uh, Senate Bill 41 wanted to provide an update uh, here for this uh, group in two, two different forms. One, uh, just to, to level set on the financial processing that was implemented with Senate Bill 41, uh, and then we'll move into the document purchase uh, uh, revenue uh, component that was asked from last meeting. Uh, 
with regards to the financial processing, before Senate Bill 41 was, was in place, the way that this, the financial workflow worked was the, the payment would be submitted from the filer into the eFile Texas program. And then when we processed that payment, which took place when the clerks accepted, we would send that payment two different directions. T Tyler would take the convenience fee portion, which would help pay for the, the interchange fees that Chase charges as part of moving the money from one person to another account. And then we would disperse all of the rest of that transaction to the county. The county would collect all of that money each month, and then they would do monthly disbursements uh, out to the various recipients like the state uh, for their fees that they were collecting on their behalf. In the new the new model with Senate Bill 41, we've actually done some of that uh, disbursement work uh, on the front end. So how the system works today is um, we, we capture that information or they capture that payment at the time of acceptance from the clerk, just like we did before, but we send the county their money, their portion, we still collect that convenience fee, but now we're sending the, the state their money directly. So it, it eliminates the need for the counties to do that monthly disbursement for the fees that are collected through that e-filing um, e -filing platform. Uh, there's still money that I think are, are collected uh, over the counter for maybe some self-represented litigants that uh, choose to not leverage the e-filing system, but that should be a small amount. What this has resulted in though, is we're doing essentially six different fee splits instead of two that we were previously doing on every single transaction. And so those convenience fees that were assessed are, are assessed each time that we're doing one of these fee splits. So our costs went up quite a bit uh, in this model. And so we're exploring uh, how can we modify this workflow on our side from a programmatic standpoint without impacting an increase in any of the convenience fees for the filers. And so that's something that we'll be working on. I think the, the um, you know, the, the, the current thought right here is to say if we can, um, you know, instead of doing that fee split uh, and sending it on every single transaction, if maybe we hold the fees uh, till the end of the day and then do the fee split one time and then disperse it into the appropriate accounts, that may be an alternative solution uh, that we can that we, we can tackle. But um, the good news is, is it should be a more efficient process for all of the uh, stakeholders, the, the, the counties, the state and, and everyone involved, which is a good thing. So it's really good to see that. Um, in terms of document processing, the last meeting that we were at, it was asked for us to go in and explore what the previous model was versus what the new uh, model is in Senate Bill 41 and see if we could do a comparison to see what the impact would be. So that's what we did. Um, so Senate Bill 41 standardized the pricing model for online document purchases uh, for uh, across the state, regardless of um, you know, uh, what tool they're using, whether they're using research, the state provided uh, tool, or whether they're using um, a locally run system. And um, that new pricing model changed it from what was previously in place, which was 10 cents per page with a max up to $6 to $1 for the first page and then 10 cents per page for every uh, page thereafter. And so what we did is we took what we saw in research last year in terms of the document purchases and just applied that model and said, if we were to use this, this alternative model, if, it, if Senate Bill 41's new model were to be in place, what would that have looked like? And the result would have been another $285,000 that the clerks would have collected uh, with this new model. So um, you can see some of the stats over here. Uh, it, the, the stats are a little skewed by a few outliers. You see the largest document uh, was 11,000 pages. I think the next largest document that was purchased uh, was, was just north of 3,000 pages. So that average kind of got skewed there. The, the median, though, was three pages per document. So that's kind of what you can expect to be the typical document purchase. All right. Um, the next uh, is our migration to the cloud. We started uh, this um, a, a few years ago, and, uh, and it's continued on. I think the most recent move was the migration of our uh, review tool. Um, we did that last year. Uh, today, about 99.6% of the volume is being processed through that new review tool. The remaining is uh, a combination of um, our support organization who's using some of the administrative functions 
uh, in that tool to, to do some correction of, of filings that maybe get into an aired state or have some of those embedded fonts that we've seen in the past. Uh, there's also uh, a two counties specifically that are um, using it just to, due to some nuances there with uh, a software issue that we've got as it pertains to stamping uh, that we're working on correcting. Uh, and hopefully once we get that done, then everybody should, should move over. We'll be at 100% there. Uh, and you can see that um, that migration over time. I think at the beginning of November, you really saw it kind of take take hold, and it's been running steady ever since. Um, our our filing portal is 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 in play too. We've implemented that, and it's been in it's been around for uh, a little over a year now. And 32% uh, of the filing volume is going through that state provided portal. Uh, we'll want to move uh, the remaining portion of the state provided filing portal volume over. Um, and we'll, we'll try to do that in a more um, uh, uh, scheduled and more methodical way later this year. Uh, the good news is that that migration should have no impact on the clerk community. It would only impact the filing community members that are still using uh, our older HTML5 version of that filing portal. And then finally, the EFM itself, which is really the hub behind the e-filing platform. It's the backbone that does all of the integrations uh, back and forth. Uh, we'll move that over to AWS later this year. And again, that'll have no impact to uh, the end users. So the filing community and the clerk community won't really notice a difference there. Uh, if they're using the same URL, we'll redirect them to the new one. Uh, this will really just be um, uh, an effort that we'll need to coordinate and work with our uh, EFM integration partners. So those EFSPs on the front end will need to point to a different uh, IP address. And then the, the um, clerks on the back end will need to point to a different uh, IP address for those messages that are getting sent back and forth. All right. Um, next, just an update on our eFile Texas 2.0 um, uh, project. Uh, there's broken down into multiple uh, cycles is what we're calling them. Um, for all intents and purposes, uh, the execution phase is, is uh, getting buttoned up in that first cycle, uh, system testing. Uh, of the EFM uh, 2022, which is the latest version, and it includes the uh, ECF 5.0, which is the new version of electronic court filing integration methods. Uh, that standard method has been implemented now, and, and that's now complete. So uh, that deployment is coming out in about a week um, on the 14th, and then we will shift over into user acceptance testing about a week later. So uh, that first phase is on track. We're Kind of get into the closeout portion now. Um, we'll do that system testing before moving it over and, uh, and and do the cutover process. As for phase two, we continue to make progress there. The analysis and design activity is complete, and uh, and we've started executing on the development portion, which is about twenty percent done now. So um, cycle three is also going to be kicked off if it hasn't already in the very near future, um, and so we'll have all three going. But as cycle one starts to taper off. Uh, cycle two will um, be in, in mid-flight and then cycle three will start to kick off. And that way we can run those uh, cycles concurrently and try to shorten that timeline as much as we possibly can. So uh, currently on track for an 8.6 uh, production deployment um, for, that first, uh, for that first phase, uh, still moving in the right, right direction there. I did mention um, just a few minutes ago about the e-file analytics. And it's something that, you know, I'm, I'm personally really excited to see, um, you know, it's taking the e-filing data that, we've, that, that we're getting and building it into a dashboard that's, um, that, that can be easily used uh, by the users to drill in and drill down into the data to get a better view of, of what's happening. And so um, I had, had an opportunity to, to dig in a little bit yesterday and, and uh, navigate around and just look at some of the statistics that were able to be pulled from this uh, from this new solution. Really neat to see. Um, and I know it's hard to see here because it's uh, the, the limited uh, real estate, screen real estate that I've got, but um, really providing a high level uh, overview of certain metrics, but then given the ability and the capacity to dig down into them to see you know, maybe individual offices and how they're performing. And in the bottom left, you'll see an example of that. The, the return for correction rate across the state for this week uh, was at 7.1%. So this is just this week. Generally, we're a little bit lower. So this week was a little bit higher, but 
you know, I went and just hovered over Ellis County and they're at 3.76. So you can, you can see, you know, the individual counties. And then if you click into it, you can actually see the district clerk versus the county clerk versus any JP offices that are, that are up. Um, you know, another example that I saw is that just this week, we collected almost $6 million uh, in, in funds for the clerk. Um, a large portion of that was in probate. Um, and you can see that even though um, guardianship cases had a large amount collected uh, or processed, the majority of that was done through waivers. So uh, no money was really collected. So it's just, you know, you can take it a step further and break this down by individual counties and offices, which is really neat to see. Getting this type of data, though, and putting it in the hands of the clerks, we're hoping will allow for them to, to, to make some data-driven decisions to maybe make their office a little bit more efficient or highlight some areas that maybe we can help in that may be problematic, um, either software-related uh, or even personnel-related. So um, the onboarding training schedule is, is about to get underway. We've got the first wave uh, coming up on the 17th. That'll take uh, the state admins and our pilot group. Uh, and then we'll go through a, a graduated rollout schedule uh, to, to roll this out uh, using a schedule that's uh, commensurate with the uh, mandatory e-filing schedule that we saw several years ago. So uh, highest populous counties first and then work our way down until we get into that, that final group. So really excited to see the feedback that we get off of, of this new solution and um, how it's going to, to help us and see the different uh, changes in the data as the clerks start to make decisions based on, on having this new, new, new data at their fingertips. All right, and last, I'd like to just uh, provide an update on Research uh, Texas. We continue to see the user account uh, grow, um, but we still get um, asked the same uh, two primary questions, which is when are we gonna get criminal data? Uh, and the second one is when will we get uh, judgments and orders in? I think the first one is is actually we're hearing it um, quite a bit from uh, the clerk community because uh, you know, they are currently running uh, a local system. Many are running a local system where data is available, and the the last kind of um, domino to fall, I think, is getting criminal data inside of research so that they can um, take those other systems that are more centralized to their location offline and start using research. Um, the second one really speaks to the integration status. That's really the key there. Uh, on getting those judgments and orders in. And as you can see, we don't have um, a large number of, of offices integrated today. So uh, something we'll want to work on, I know uh, as part of the new uh, Texas UCMS project, I think there's a requirement to integrate with research. So we're hopeful that that'll, that'll help move us in the right direction on, on research. So um, overall, I think a, a, a pretty good update on where we are uh, with those two items being the, the most sought after. Gary, it looks like we have a question from John Warren. John, you want to ask your question? Yep. Terry, can you define what category of um, people are identified as registered users? Yeah, Within absolutely. Clerks, judges, or attorneys. What what demographic group are, is that? Yeah. So we've got we've got clerks that obviously are the clerks. You got judges who are the judges. You got attorneys who are the attorneys. Registered users would be anyone else. So it could be. Um, you know, a, a paralegal or a legal assistant. It could be um, a, just a general public user that wants to have access to the system to go in and, and you know, and, and look up his or her case maybe, or even a case that may be interested, uh, they may be interested in. It, it would be anyone outside of those three user communities, the clerks, the judges, and the attorneys. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Casey, can, can we move the yeah, we, picture so I can see the numbers with integrated. Bond yeah, integrated it's thirty nine and six forty six, and six forty six is not integrated. Okay, thirty nine integrated, thirty nine integrated. And I'm colorblind. I, I just want to make sure the the clerks are the ones on the, the the little one on the bottom, and then the registered users is the big one on the top. Those That's colors. right. Yeah. 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 Oh, is that right? Okay. Terry. Yeah, Terry. Mm -hmm. I think Terry was not even said, right, Terry? Yeah, the, the the blue line at the bottom, it's relatively small as the clerks. The red line that's very difficult to see on that bar chart is the judges. The green would be the attorneys. Um, and then the the purple would be the registered user. So anyone that doesn't fall into those three categories. Blue and purple look the same, but I get it. That's I just wanted to make sure we space. 
I'm not sure that's a colorblind problem. But yeah, that may be a projector problem. The bulb is a little weak on this one, so it's hard to see. Are these uh, are these numbers or or uh, percentages based on filing data per user or just based on registered users? Uh, which data are you referring to, Mark? Well, yeah, in the like the the large amounts of purple. If there were a lot of paralegals and paralegals were doing the majority of the filing, would it represent the number of paralegals or the based on the number of filings attributed to that category? No, this is the number of, of users within each category that's that's logged in and used this site. So we've got about 75,000 users of the site, and this is broken down by just are they going in, logging in, and, and using the system. Okay. So we, we mentioned that we had, you know, 535 users, registered users or licensed users. Some of those are, um, you know, self-represented litigants that have logged in over time and then you know, kind of fallen off as their cases has gotten, you know, disposed of. Um, some of those are attorneys that maybe have, have you know, retired um, and, and kind of gone offline. What we're seeing in research is a, you know, a continuum of about 75,000 users that are, that are using it, using the environment. So Terry, I, I'm jumping the, the gun a little bit because you haven't gotten to that section yet, but you mentioned for orders to work, there's some integrations you're working. We, uh, we talked about the uh, free case management service that we're providing to smaller counties. Will that function exist yes. within that tool? Yes. So that can help motivate our right. other and, and integrated and, partners to get their stuff going too. So and dab things. dabbling in the UCMS update, I can tell you that there are 30, three zero counties on the list that are participating. So that number will go from 39 to 69 fairly quickly. And the other thing to keep in mind, and, and Tyler has a page with this on it, of those 39, you've got, you know, Dallas County, Collin County, I believe Denton County is on that list, um, El Paso. So some of the larger top 10 counties are in the integrated list of counties. So keep that in mind is that there are- I assume the, the big the large, ones The big covered. ones are, are- So it sounds like we have the big ones and the little ones and, and the everybody middle in the middle, we have to- Maybe the missing one to yeah. kind of shuttle in. All right. And Casey, that, that was my update. Um, okay. To open it up for any additional questions that anybody may have. Any questions for Terry? So, so y'all did roll out a version Saturday, correct? Right, and there I was an update that was performed on, on this weekend. This past weekend, right? For, for E-File Texas. For E-File Texas. Yeah, and then we're we're yes, and then we're we're also um, following the deployment cadence for the review side, um, and so we've modified that recently based on some feedback that we received. So uh, that that new model uh, for deploying on the review tool, it's it's kind of you know, it, the late last year we were we were doing it out of necessity, but we received some feedback on both sides. Uh, some that are saying you know that that weekly updates that we were applying. Uh, was disruptive. And then we, we heard on the other side that the weekly updates were really good because we were getting, you know, some new functionality and even some bug fixes in a much faster pace than, than previously. So the, the kind of happy medium on where we landed, at least temporarily, is to shift our focus on those deployments to be really bug fix only. So only defect fixes uh, for the majority of them, meaning every week we'll focus on just a a few key uh, defects that we want to resolve that are the highest priority and implement those. The reason we want to keep that in place is because we feel like it's important to continue to improve on the, the system that we offer, but, but also those defects represent um, opportunities for us to do that in a non-disruptive manner, meaning most of the issues that, um, uh, most of the updates that cause issue are often related to new enhancements that we roll out that break another piece of the application and create a defect. But when we're resolving a specific defect, it's a more laser-focused uh, type deployment. So 
our new deployment schedule is to do bug fix only deployments weekly. And then towards the end of the month, we'll do a, uh, an update that would include bug fixes and new features, but we will have a two week period for that update. So that should afford additional testing time leading into that new update uh, that would apply those new features and, and giving additional testing runway for any of the clerks that wish to test prior to, to that going into production. The only thing I would ask is if more communication can be done, because I don't think there was any communication this weekend that it rolled out or not. Um, so we were unsure, but it looks like one of the bugs that we were waiting on did get rolled out because we haven't seen it this week, but there was nothing confirming that. And then if, if you are rolling out weekly bug fixes, if we can get communication on what those are, that would be great as well. Yeah, Tracy, there's a uh, there's a, a web page that we keep up to date. It's called the version updates page. And uh, and every week when we do updates uh, to stage and then into production, we update that. It has a list of everything that's included in that fix. Uh, and you can go in and see that. We also have a uh, the next couple of updates that we have planned. So you have that uh, view on that. We are modifying that. It's going to take us a little while to get there to, to modify it the way that we want to. But uh, there's a few things that we're doing. One, we want to provide more visibility into our long-term deployment cadence. So it pro provide at least a three-month view of the upcoming update so you know exactly when we're going to be doing it. And then we would put in there what we would be doing, just like we're doing today, so you have visibility into what's going in. And then secondly, we're also running those automation tests after each one of those updates. So when we perform the update, we run through a series of automation tests that validate similar or, or commonly used use cases across the state. Um, and, and that gives us some feedback on whether or not, you know, it's a quality uh, deployment or if it identifies issues. Over time, what we want to do is start working with each of the counties to get maybe some of their jurisdiction specific use cases so that we can understand those and build automation tests to cover those as well. And then, and then eventually get to a position where we take an objective uh, measurement of the quality of those upgrades and then measure that for every upgrade that we do so that we can see the quality over time. And that way, if we see that we're, we are causing issues by introducing new bugs, then we can then alter our deployment cadence or focus uh, more heavily on the quality side. So uh, just some things that, that, that we're going to be doing this year to try to improve uh, even further. Happy to send that link to you, though, Tracy. Yeah, so, yeah, if you can send that link, that would be great. I probably have it somewhere, but I have lost it, I'm sure. Yeah, and um, if you're in the application, you can also go to the nine box in the top right-hand corner, and if you click on it, it's one of the links there in that nine box, and you can click there and get there as well. Okay, anything else? Thank you, Terry. Welcome. Thanks, Thanks everyone. So um, just a quick update on the uniform case management system. Um, Y'all recall last meeting, OCA had awarded the contract um, to three different vendors. Two of those vendors have identified um, an early adopter county and are currently working with that county to implement their version of the statewide case management system or the uniform case management system. Um, as Dennis mentioned, one of the requirements of the systems be that they integrate with electronic filing, uh, two-way integration, and they also integrate with research taxes. And then the other thing that we're doing is uh, making sure that it can do the batch upload function to DPS, because we're seeing a lot of the smaller counties still to where they would go to the DPS website and key in manually criminal convictions. And they have the batch functions that I think the larger counties are taking advantage of, but then we can do the same thing on our system. Um, How does that work with two separate vendors implementing two separate statewide programs? Are we going to ultimately pick one? And no. So we, we'll let the counties continue to choose. But with the early adopter, we're setting the statewide standard for that product. So the two vendors that are currently working are iDocket and Tyler. And so as we're configuring that first early adopter, we're setting the standard for that product statewide so that anybody else who's gonna use that product, we won't be doing extra configuration just for them. So the two products won't be identical, but they'll all have the same key features we need. Correct. Which is the integration on both ends. Correct. And batch upload. And okay. Correct. But if, if one falls substantially behind the other in functions, there's no reason for that county 
to pick that one. Correct. It's going to be hard right. to stay in business. If you yeah. Kind of so, product. so basically, the way the contract was done um, is it's it's more like a license to hunt. So, when these three vendors were awarded, you know, they need to go out and recruit their early adopter counties and then get the list of counties behind them. Um, combine the two vendors have another after the two early adopters, which will be on later this year. Um, they have a combined list of roughly 30 counties that have picked up that system that OCA is paying for. And so we're looking at two of, are there other counties that want to join from the under 20,000? Because if there are, we may have to go to the legislature and say, hey, this was a lot more successful than we thought it was going to be. And we're going to need more money to bring more people on. So um a question just yeah, out, of okay. out of curiosity if you have uh two different vendors and the counties get to choose which ones they're going to go with if they choose wrongly so to speak and they want to go with the other is there going to be an ability to, to take everything you have in the one system and put it over in the other real fast i don't know yes you can go from a to b i don't i'll i i do not know that's real fast <laughs> Um, but there is, I believe there is mechanisms in the contracts that talk about how you can exit from the system um, because it may, it's, we've got that in the contract just because um, there may be the case to where a vendor goes under, you know, let's say something bad happens and Tyler goes belly up, then, you know, all of a sudden these counties that are running the Tyler vended product are going to need to jump on the new case management. And so the contract does stipulate that in those cases that there is an, an exit path out so that the counties get a copy of all their data and documents that they can then move to the next system. But they, they get a copy, they'll be able, the different systems will be able to read the different copies, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, they'll, it'll be a mapping exercise for the new system to figure out, oh, this is where you're keeping the parties, this is where you're keeping the documents. But then once that exercise is done, then it's a matter of just pulling it through. Okay. Thank you. All right. So then just over the next couple of meetings, you'll see me uh, give an update with here are the counties that are moving on to the system and where we are. Um, as they do move on, that number that Terry showed with the number of counties that are integrated is going to continue to go up just because that's a requirement of the system that they be integrated. And so we expect that number to continue to go up and have more counties with orders and judgments and, and all the document goodness. I'm really excited. Do, do we have any of the counties that are early adopters as liaison or voting members of this committee? I don't think we do because they're small. They're all the combo clerk yeah. type counties. Interesting to hear it goes. Yeah, no, we are too. We're excited about it just because these are both both vendors are cloud based um, out in the cloud and it's geared towards where for counties that have little to no IT, which is awesome because then too I've, I've got a place in Sabine County and Hemp Hill is kind of a very small town and like, the internet's just getting there. So right. I, I can imagine those small towns, this is really revolutionary. It's gonna help them a lot. Yeah. So Casey, this, this is uh, John Warren. I was you, you mentioned just what I was going to ask. None of these small counties have um, IT support. So how are you guys managing to get that done? So because they're cloud-based, we're requiring them to be very low touch to where there are very easy minimum requirements on computing equipment. Um, if a smaller county doesn't have the computer, like a physical machine, mm -hmm. um, then OCA has new to them machines that we can give to them at no cost as well that they can then have. And because it's web-based, those machines already have Chrome and Edge on them. And so basically you just need to, you'll need to buy a monitor because we don't have extras of those, but yeah. we'll give you the chassis, the keyboard, the mouse, and you provide the internet connection and then you should be good to go. Okay. So all the work is done by the staff that beat the end to the network and takes care of the, um, they don't even have to VPN. You're, it's all web based, so you just oh, go. I'm, I'm talking about the uh, the technical support that's actually setting up the systems and how's how are they getting training? So the the train you you mean with the UCMS system itself? Yes. All of that's all of that's written into the contract. So the vendors that are doing it are on the hook to train, 
and provides uh, support, much like e-filing. Uh, we've got a service level okay. agreement with both of them and service levels so that we can we can know that that's all being performed and being done. Okay. You, yeah. you can't have it yet, John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't have it yet. You can't have it. <laughs> the smaller I'm, I'm, I'm good as is. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the other thing with that, too, is the larger counties we see using a more rich feature set just because I imagine if Tracy looked at it, she would be like, there's no way that we could handle the volume and the processes because there's so many judges and so much yeah. complexity yeah. versus, you know, the target population of 20,000 or less. It's the right. Sabine counties right. of the world to where, you know, you get it's perfect for them. It's a couple all cases a week and, you know, you may have a hearing here and there and just kind of awesome. easy going case <laughs> management. <laughs> which would be awesome. Okay. Okay. All right. That's, standards. So uh, with standards, so there's one change in standards that um, that I don't even think we need to vote on it because it's just a technical correction to the previous version. Has to do with um, copies. So the standard currently says copies electronic, and the way Tyler implemented it, I believe, and Terry, you can jump in if I'm wrong, is that there's actually two electronic copies. Electronic copies, uh, 10 pages or less, that'll charge you a dollar. And electronic copies, more than 10 pages, that'll just charge you 10 cents a page. And so- So it's conforming cent to 41. Right. And so it's, we put electronic copies, we just didn't split it out between the number of pages. And it turns out we need to do that in order to get it matched up with what, what's actually going on in reality. Terry, did I did I say that correctly? Okay. Yes. Thank you. And that's all we have for the uh, standards committee. Excellent. All right. Order subcommittee. Carlos, Todd. Yep. So lead off. If y'all want, Todd, I'll go ahead and get started and just sort of um, lay a little bit of the groundwork and then I'll turn it over of course to Todd or, or John or anybody else who's on the subcommittee who wants to, to add or supplement to, to the general report. The kind of, to you know, as a refresher, the purpose of the subcommittee is to try to help uh, facilitate the process of getting orders and judgments online um, on research. Um, and um, and available to to the public and and everybody. Uh, we've had several subcommittee meetings. I think it's been extremely collaborative and very helpful. Um, there's a lot of people that I'd like to express appreciation for everything they've done. There's there's sort of two aspects um, of of the work. Um, one that we're gonna I'm gonna show you in just a second when I screen share. And then uh, the other one is more ongoing and we just sort of frankly, mostly on me ran out of time to have another subcommittee meeting of all the clerks as to the specifics of the process, even though I know uh, Casey may have a sort of flow chart to help us kind of conceptualize some of this. But the idea is twofold. One, to have the right rules or new rule amendments that need to be done, if any. Uh, to make sure that the orders are getting actually filed online, whether by the judge or by through the case management systems. Uh, and then secondly, making sure that there's a, as much as possible a uniform process flow. In the course of the subcommittee work, one of the big issues that, that came up uh, is the, the, the problem, frankly, or the inconsistency with proposed orders. And so there are some counties where uh, proposed orders come in with cover letters or a notice of filing um, and, and that gets stamped. There are some where the actual proposed order itself gets filed, understandably, um, because it's coming into the clerk's record. But then there's some confusion because the order will have uh, a date when it was actually received in the clerk's office. The judge will then sign the order or maybe modification of the order on a different date. And it's not clear when the order was then uh, not only signed by the judge, but then filed with the clerk after being signed. Um, and so in connection with that, we're trying to find best ways to deal with process flow, 
um, and, and making sure we can, can make it as accessible to everybody as possible. There's also been some, um, some concern that sometimes it's hard sometimes in particular for some of the clerks to, to kind of force judges to do what they may not want to do. Sometimes it's hard for, to get the judges to uh, do the filing part of the order or to respond back in the case management system. And so we want to try to do everything we can to um, facilitate that running smoothly across the state. Uh, so those are some of the issues that we've been addressing. Uh, there's a proposed, uh, some proposed rule changes that I would want to open up to this general committee for just comment and feedback. Um, and then, um, and then of course, you know, any other questions or, or things that come up is, is there Todd or, or, or John or, or, or Velva or anybody on the subcommittee, uh, Judge Ferguson want to add anything to that initially? Carlos, I'd say that you, you um, you basically laid it out perfectly as, as it is, so I don't I don't have anything further to add. Yeah, same here. Okay, and 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 Laura too. All right, well then let me uh, see if I can share screen uh, with the proposed rule changes. And again, these are are very um, we're we're not ready to ask for a vote on this. Really, what we would like is feedback. Uh, Laura brought some uh, suggested changes to this. Melba, Judge Hind uh, helped orient us on some of the um, sort of particular rules to look at. But but let me, I'm going to unzoom this a little bit so it might be easier to see. Um, there are uh, the first, there, there are a couple of rule revisions and then a brand new rule. So I'll start with the rule revisions um, that we were discussing. One is uh, rule 26 that has to do with the, cl the clerk's record and the responsibility to, to, to maintain that. And we specifically thought it would be good to clarify that this would include specifically the court's uh, orders that are signed and electronically filed. Again, emphasizing the process part of it and being filed. Uh, similarly, uh, rule 297, where uh, the court is one of the few rules that actually require the court to file things, uh, it's findings of facts and conclusions of law that we wanted to clarify that it should be served electronically and mailed or mailed to pro se or, or self-represented litigants. At all points, we always wanna be mindful of the pro se litigants who, who are not required to electronically uh, file or be e-served, uh, even though as I think the report uh, from Terry indicates, many of them are. Uh, and then finally, there's the notice of judgment, which is very important. Uh, and also one that involves uh, communications of that regard. And we wanted to make sure that that be, um, that there be revisions from the old first class mail to being um, e-filed e um, and then served to any self-represented litigant. So those are the, those are the, the rule changes that we had been discussing uh, that are really kind of small revisions to existing rules. The, the, potential rule, and we may not need it. There may be technical fixes or other ways to address this problem that don't involve having to go to the court and having the rules committee and the rules attorney and everybody else get involved. But uh, the suggestion uh, was to make it very clear that upon signing of an order, the court must electronically file it with the clerk. And then there was uh, immediately came from some language in some of the other rules I don't know if immediately is the right phrase, but uh, so we throw that out for discussion, but certainly promptly give notice to the parties uh, and attorneys of record. And then the second paragraph addresses this more technical way to do that. The court may do it by the many judges. I think Judge Ferguson could speak to this. We'll just e-file it themselves or have somebody in their office e-file it. Uh, another alternative is to, within, with the case management systems, whether integrated or not, uh, is to sign the order on the case management system and that will trigger an event that will then hopefully upload it. If it's integrated automatically on research, if not integrated uh, with some activity, then uploading it onto research. Um, and then um, and then being clear that the e-filing will satisfy this requirement. So that's these are the, on the rule side, to the extent that we needed to go that way, uh, what, what the proposals from the subcommittee were um, that uh, I think some people thought might be helpful in, in, in helping the transition to getting all the judges in the chambers to be e-filing orders um, so that they're available on, on research. So that with that, I'll kind of pause for now. Judge Quinn. 
A quick question with regard to the rule that, you, that you're proposing and it says the judge shall uh, electronically file and immediately give notice. Why, uh, why the judge giving immediately giving notice as opposed to the judge filing with the clerk and then the clerk immediately giving notice? You think uh, the judges may forget that last step or hesitate or et cetera? Um, uh, and then let me make sure I'm understanding your question. I, I think if they e-file or e-serve, then that would automatically give notice to the parties. I think that would satisfy the requirement. Um, I think that the reason to have, I, I, I think. Well, I'm thinking, is it a two-step process or really a one-step process by default? Once you file it, once the judge files it with the clerk, it's automatically going to be giving or the judge is automatically going to be giving notice to the parties, et cetera, et cetera. Or is it the judge files with the clerk and then takes the second step where he has to give notice to everybody else? I think to answer that question, if the court, the judge uses e-filing, e-service, or the CMS system, it should automatically go to the parties. And so it's a one-step process. Sometimes... I think people may still be, for instance, signing orders on paper, handing them, um, and then they would have to be somehow filed and served in the system. But, but yes, it's it's really a one step system. I think. This is Ed Wells. Just the way that is written, I wish it, the language would make it clear that for those courts that are signing the document it's automatically filed with the clerk that it's the clerk's responsibility from that point forth or the case management system's responsibility to provide that notice not the court because the court may not have a mechanism to do that depending on how the system is set up yeah that that, that was kind of where i was going is i think and i know it's a vestige from our rules but the court is a little ambiguous because there's several officers of the court that perform different functions. And so, you know, the judge signs the order, the clerk does, but usually the clerk handles accepting and distributing uh, documents, not the, not the judge. And so it may just be, we need to be a little bit more specific about which officer of the court is performing which function. So it could say, you know, I'm having trouble reading it, but the, judge must tender the order to the clerk. Maybe this is too much micromanaging. The clerk must either electronically file it and immediately give notice or such and such. Yeah. It's just kind of clearly defining which person who makes up the court is actually performing which function. Yeah, <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I, I love your, your language there, Judge Hines, about it being a, a vestige from past rules, because that is where the word immediately comes from, is the notice rule says that the court shall immediately. And so we were, one thing that we were trying to do in these revisions was adhere to the pre-existing rule as closely as we could, knowing that you know, too much tinkering around would maybe make getting a rule through a little more difficult. Um, but that said, that's a, that's a great point, and maybe we should even be willing to go beyond a little bit and say, to clarify you know, generally to the extent necessary in this rule, who's doing what? Because there's, you're absolutely right. You know, if it's too ambiguous, then someone's going to say, well, I, that was the court, that wasn't me. Or the, the court may assume, well, that was my clerk. Right. Yeah. Well, and the other interesting piece of it is that depending on how your systems operate, if the judge is doing something electronically, if it's with e-file, you're right. They hit the button and e-serve it, and the e-filing system is sending that service and notice out to the parties versus your case management system, which may or may not do it. But is that is the CMS functioning on behalf of the judge or on behalf of the clerk? If I recall correctly, it's been three and a half years now. Uh, the way it worked in Harris County is I would electronically sign it and I would forget what the button was called. I'd press a button and that notified my court clerk, okay, there's an order ready for me to process. But the court clerk had to do their stuff to 
operate and, and archive it in the, in the system and everything. So it wasn't, you know, necessarily entered in the case file until the clerk did her part. So, and of course, we all know with Harris County, everything's just, it's, it's a, it's a customized system. So it's always a little bit different than what everyone else is doing. But I, that, that was kind of the workflow that we handled there. No, but I think tying down responsibilities as we move into this new is new system and new ways of processing makes an awful lot of sense if we're going to do it. We ought to do it now. I know that Mark, you have your hand up, and then I know I, I was hoping maybe to hear from Tracy or, or Judge Ferguson because I know that we've got some discussion about that as well. Go ahead, Mark. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, so if, if the goal is, and I haven't seen, I'm not, I think I might have seen this briefly once before, but if the goal is to provide, you know, quasi, you know, real time notice to the litigant or the attorney with a copy of the order, uh, there seems to be sort of mandatory language or or shall language with regards to the court or the judge, if you will, and uh, permissive language or may language, uh, uh, well, permissive language to the clerks to the extent that it says if it's signed and e-filed. In other words, that and e-filed is a prerequisite for the clerk to take action. So what if it were to say and slash or unless otherwise, unless notice was otherwise provided already by the court or the judge? And that way, it would cover, and it would cover the the goal without providing a gap in in the what if scenario. If that makes sense, I'm not sure I'm following you. And I think and I think one of the issues is sometimes, especially in larger counties, I think that the the clerk's office is not necessarily going to know what the court in a particular chamber or, or particular court did or didn't do to provide notice. So I think. Um, I think that I'm, I, you know, and 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 I'll tell you that we we went with must rather than shall on this because I think that's been the modern trend with modern rules has been more towards must rather than shall. Uh, but with regards to the the may that you're referring to, um, were you talking about? I guess in, in the are you talking about in the the third paragraph right here? The court may give required notice or no? No, I was actually looking at uh, and and I don't remember. Um... Most of the language that it says, it says uh, signed and electronically filed. In other okay. words, if the judge of the court doesn't electronically file it, does that then take away that responsibility? So shouldn't it say and or so that it gets docketed and, and everything else? Which which paragraph are you looking at? Um, well, in, in all of the paragraphs, but the part that TRCP 26, each court, each clerk shall also, and again, it's not big, it's too super big there. Uh, each, each clerk shall also keep a court docket. In other words, a record, right? And we're trying to say that a record needs to be kept or it needs to be put on a docket sheet. I assume that's what that, that is referring to. Uh, for the, the um, including specifically court orders signed and electronically filed. Well, if it's not electronically filed, then does that mean they don't have to keep that record? No. So maybe maybe it should say and or electronically signed. That's my suggestion. It's a small thing. But, so, uh, so there's a gap there. So you're saying you're saying they should that there should be regardless of whether it's electronically filed, people should get noticed. I think what we're trying to achieve is to make sure that every sort order that is signed gets electronically filed. We're trying right, to I, I know, I know, but if for some reason it doesn't happen because you you provided this contingency, well, sometimes it's hard to get them to do it or this or that. Uh, what what also is a, a known issue or problem is, um, and it's because of forms and some attorneys and stuff like that. They'll put this document contains sensitive information, right? So it doesn't get electronically filed or it doesn't get pushed on. And so sometimes it's not even showing up in the docket sheet in, in certain places. So if we're trying to be global and we're trying to say, okay, hey, we're gonna try and catch all the problems, this seems like it might be a problem uh, at some point. Well, Mark, and I appreciate that. And I think part of that is the problem, the, the difference between proposed orders and real orders. And I um, mean, one of the things that, and I think Tracy and our subcommittee was extremely helpful in showing us what some of these 
what, what some of the concerns and problems are is that, for instance, sometimes somebody will file a document, just it's called default judgment, which is really proposed default judgment. It's just a lawyer asking a court to take action, but it has a file stamp on it and it could appear to somebody representing a party as if it's an actual order of the court. Um, and, and so, I mean, with, with regards to things that are filed because of sensitive information aren't filed, I don't think that would apply typically to most orders once signed. I think that would be, there, there would be some that, that might be excluded, but the vast majority of, of orders signed by a judge would be part of the clerk's record and, and filed. Wouldn't it be, I'm sorry to interrupt, wouldn't it be easier just say including specifically signed orders, period? There you go. Sounds like we're just wanting to make sure, I mean, I think every clerk knows that yeah, I need to keep my signed orders and judgments in the, in the file, but if we just said signed orders, we're not talking about only electronically signed orders or digitally signed orders or just electronically signed orders that were electronically filed. We're, we're just saying including signed orders. Right, Judge, the reason I'd say that we were doing this rule revision was because we're trying to highlight that things need to be electronically filed. And so I think to, to go in that direction, we basically don't need a rule change at all. I mean, that, that is absolutely sort of the, the essence of what the rule is right now. Um, this is just, again, another way, you know, if we, to the extent we want to make sure these orders are electronically filed and available to the public, uh, these were the potential rules that, that look like they might could use some revisions. So uh, well, I'm emphasizing on top of that, the, the very real problem of courts signing orders and parties not being notified. Uh, so it's, it's really those two, those twin aims as we discussed uh, earlier. I guess, I, I guess maybe I'm beating a dead horse. I have a problem with putting the onus on the court to give notice. I understand you're saying it's probably going to be automatic and we'd have to ensure that the program makes it automatic. But it seems that the proper person would be the clerk. Uh, an attorney who may not receive notice is not going to call the court. It's going to call the clerk and say, has this been filed? Has this been there? Did you send it to me or, or what? Uh, we don't know. Uh, and that's, it seems like the clerk's function is to send out, uh, to record, send out notices. I, it may be the clerk would rather be the one in control of that and not rely on the many judges in her district or his district uh, to, to perform the notification. Uh, I'm just, again, I think the onus should be on the clerk. John and then Ed. Ed had his hand. Ed had his hand raised first. I would rather hear Ed is coming from a court's perspective, so I'd rather hear the court's perspective from uh, from Ed before I make my comment. There you go. Okay, Ed. And sadly, I was really looking forward to hearing John's, but uh, <laughs> uh, no, kind of echoing what Judge Quinn is saying. Um, it should be on the clerk, and if it is e-filed and it's happening automatically through that process, then there's no issue anyway. And, and when I'm looking at all these rules, when I look at the one at the top proposed that says upon signing any order, then any order that's signed is going to have to be electronically filed with the clerk, notice given, and the clerk somewhere in there needs to, it, it needs to be included that it should be e-filed. But that shouldn't be on the court, that shouldn't be on the judge. We're making judges system actors to a degree unforeseen when we move away from paper and that's just part of the process but we have to make sure we keep clear the role of the court versus the role of the clerk and, and i'm saying this partially in jest tracy but if we continue down this path i'm going to find myself asking for positions from the clerk's office so that we can do work being put on the court that traditionally has been clerk function and the, the, the trend has been moving in that direction and we need to make sure it's clear. It's easy in the appellate courts where clerk and court are all the same, but in trial courts, that's not the case. And especially in the large jurisdictions where you're right, we have many judges, many courts. 
Uh, and so right. I, and, I and think there's a better way to do this. And Ed, I, I was clear in the subcommittee that it is on the clerk. So I know I, I've been pushing the committee for that. the clerk, but, but I also was pushing not for the clerk to individually electronically file it back into the system as well, because that's going to be an issue on our side with our counting of our size. Right. But, no, and I, I get that, um, but it shouldn't but, be but, on the court to do that. Right. And as I was showing them, you know, the, the attorney files the proposed order. And then basically what happens after that, once the parties approach and have the hearing for the judge to sign the order, the clerk preps that filed proposed order to the judge. The judge then reviews it. And if they sign it, then it's automatically sent back to the clerk for her entry into right. the case management system, as well as um, we have electronic notices already set up right. in our case management system. So um, it's technically um, the way we see it, the, the judge is not filing it with us. The judge right. is signing the order and then we're making our entries and uh, giving notice to the attorneys. Right. So the word file, the judge, the court filing it with a clerk, I had an issue with as well. But it's it's up to it's up to y'all and the group and in finding out the appropriate wording for these rule changes. I was gonna uh, well, I, it is absolutely correct. It is the responsibility of the clerk. It must first be docketed or entered on the in by the clerk, and then the clerk gives notice that we have docketed this, and so we're letting you know that we have docketed this, and this is your this is your notification that this action has taken place. The thing is, as it relates to the, this is um, as we have evolved at, and um, and to remote proceedings. Um, we have to make sure we, we want to be more efficient and the judges use an electronic signatures gives us that efficiency. And so otherwise we have, uh, uh, there are a lot of clerk's offices, the large jurisdictions, our, our offices are paperless. The only paper we have is for those individuals or those um, uh, court participants that, that are refusing or just reluctant to use um, electronic processes. Given having the judge making the judge participate and be willing to participate by using electronic signatures. It gets us there faster. It gets those documents to us, those uh, orders to us faster. We can enter the information faster and we can send notice faster. And so if we can get the buy-in from the courts to use electronic signature, send it to us electronically, we'll take care of the rest. But what we don't want to do is continue to operate in both a paper and paperless environment, particularly when the judges during COVID, uh, the judges were signing things remotely. And so, and they, and they were physically signing paper. And then we're, my office is getting it five, six, seven days later. And so that is a problem. So and and I, and we were. It was my understanding that this was going, going to fix that issue. Bella, I see your hands raised. Um, I'm going to join in with John Warren. I mean, we are. We just went to Odyssey in October, and half of our judges are using e-filing. Half of them are printing it out, and we have to go upstairs and get it, and then put it into our system. And the other half is using an internal mechanism, and that's just Travis County. And John is right. We have judges who are using multiple ways to get us orders, which yeah. right now it's their province to do it. But if this rule gets implemented, it has to be mostly one way. Otherwise, otherwise it's going to be very difficult for the clerks to get the, to follow the rule, to get out the notices immediately. So... And, and to, to add to what Velva was saying, um, well, uh, the, we, we're not, we're not, the, the clerks are not rejecting sending out the notice. That's, that's part of our responsibility. But what we don't want to have to do is operate in multiple uh, environments, paper, electronic, and some others. We, it, it's more efficient to have one. Uh, and, and that's why I think the idea also came up that, you know, to the extent we can continue to have at various um, like continuing education and that sort of thing to make sure the judges are doing it in a way that provides the signed orders to the clerks uh, as soon as possible and in, in, in a format that provides for the electronic process to proceed. So 
Mr. Boyd, do you have a sense of what the court's appetite might be to kind of looking at all the rules where we just say the court in the rules then perhaps clarifying which officer of the court is responsible for those functions? Because I think a lot of what we're dealing with here is we're trying to stay in line with how the rules are already written by saying the court must do this. But we all have a sense that it's actually a particular person in the court that does this or versus something like that. And so we see, or I see with some revisions for, for these rules, how that could be fixed with electronic filing, but I'm seeing it all over the place in the rules of civil procedure. And so if we start being specific on these electronic orders rules, then we create questions of, well, what about these other rules? Is there ambiguity there? And, and you know, I just don't know how far down that path we might want to suggest the court look at in terms of a rules revision. Uh, and I know I'm just dropping this on you. But yeah. just, I'd, I'd love to hear your input. I'm sure, I'm sure our rules attorney and your legal assistant would be happy to, to go through and look. It just seems to me, yeah, it's cooling off a little. Thank you. Um, this hasn't been an issue until what we're dealing with here, right? I, I mean, if if there are places throughout the rules that say the court shall ensure that this happens, or the, the court shall do that, and if it takes both the court, meaning the judge and his or her staff attorney and court coordinator or whatever, we're doing one thing and then the clerk's office doing another, but the rule just says the court shall. I don't know that, I, I, I certainly haven't, maybe y'all are familiar with any situation where that's been confusing before, but here it becomes more confusing because it's clear that they both have to do something to get this done. And it may just be the simple way, but it seems to me, I mean, there's, Sort of goal number one is to make sure when, when an order is signed, it gets into the case management or the court file, let's say the case file, which really, if you're electronic, means into the case management system, right? And goal number two is it immediately or at least promptly gets sent to the to the lawyers. And, um, and if it's electronic and you file it through e-filing into the case management system, it's going to automatically get sent, right? So it may be that the rule could just simply say the court and clerk shall ensure that the signed order is immediately filed and served on the parties, right? And then each county has to figure out how to do that. But what I'm hearing now is there's an appetite for saying, well, we want to tell the counties, you have to do it electronically. Um, what John was talking about is that there's some appetite for exploring the idea of whether the rules should say courts have to electronically sign, at least when feasible or something. I, I don't know how honestly feasible it is to, to adopt a rule like that, but if there's appetite for doing it, the court would, 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 would prefer to have that, right, in a perfect world. Um, but we recognize there's differences in counties and how things get done. The, it's always the tension of how much we should mandate that things get done a particular way because that is the best way to do it. It's just not always easy for every county to do it that way. So we wanna be sympathetic to that and figure out solutions to get them all there. So to answer your question, do we wanna look broadly at all the rules? We can, but I haven't noticed that being an issue and maybe the easier solution is just to say, the court and clerk shall and tell them to do what we want them to have to do. And to the extent we want to explore promoting the e-filing system and e-service system by telling what they shall do is use that, we're all for that. Whether that's feasible, you guys will help us work through the, the details of that. Does that answer your question, Will? Wonderful. Thank okay. you very much. Now, on the back end, then the issue is how do you get it into Research Texas? Right. And we want that, too. Right, we, I mean, because we want the orders in Research Texas, um, but how's always the challenge, and, and this is this has been the process, what, for 15 years now, right, is every step, we want to get there, but we realize we got to go through this process of making sure we're identifying 
all the obstacles and finding the solutions to those obstacles. And that, that's what y'all are so great at doing, so. This is uh, uh, Judge Ridgeway. Uh, I'm right now, I sit as a visiting judge for a number of courts and I, I end up signing orders, but I, if it's e-signature and I'm a visiting judge, I'm not sure how that's going to work. But what, what's happening is in a matter of practice is they, they're uh, giving me a copy of the order to sign. I, I sign it and then it's electronically scanned right back into the system, usually within minutes. So uh, I don't know how you accommodate uh, visiting judges uh, who may not have the e-signature capabilities for other courts. If I, if I may, as, um, to Justice Boyd, I'm not quite sure if I'm, that is a good chemistry where it says the court and clerk. <laughs> I think, um, I, but I do believe that we should say where applicable, the judge signs electronically and the clerk um, notifies the parties of the, um, the, um, of the uh, final judgment. And I guess in some instances, we'll just have to up, but well, we, we have the, um, the automatic. So every, everything we do is automatically uh, uploaded to Research Texas. But, uh, but I, um, I think we have to be more, it has to be more clarification because there's always gonna be battles between uh, clerks and courts as to what some uh, uh, interpretation of language. So I think it's I think it'll be better if we say we're applicable. The judge signs electronically. If they have that capability, they do it. Then it autom and then it gets up to Research Texas automatically, and it goes to the and it goes to the clerk, and the clerk does its constitutional duty of making sure that we have th that we are doing things proper and in order and maintaining the records. And the uh, the notification comes from the court docket that ma that's maintained by the clerk that goes to the parties. Then we were able to accomplish that. Uh, to, but to uh, Judge Ridgeway, I think if you're going to be a um, a visiting judge consistently in a county, I think that and if they're using the, a case management system, they should make you a user on the system so that you can do that. Or, but but depends on the volume. Uh, it may be that those are the instances where we actually the the, the clerk's offices may, uh, and I won't speak for a clerk in a smaller jurisdiction, but an option may be that in those instances they actually scan those and and then upload them into the case management system. So John, That's am what's right, going on there. Am I right that if we divvy up the responsibilities, basically it's the court, I parentheses judge and his or her staff, their job to make sure the signed order gets into the case file, case management system or whatever, right? It's usually the yeah. clerk. The clerk, well, yeah. it has to get to the clerk, right? Right. Okay. Right. That's yeah. what, so, yeah. so the judge has to what? do something to get it to the clerk and yeah. then it's the clerk's job to make sure it's into that case file and served on the parties. Right. Exactly. If, if the judge that signs it electronically, all of that happens automatically. But if, if they sign it by hand and run it down to the clerk's office or whatever that, so it may, may be That's using that word ensure, the court shall ensure that, and then the clerk shall ensure that it gets some place in the file and serve. But, but again, if we're open to, you know, the court shall electronically sign and then build in whatever caveats, you know, it, yeah. unless, Right. right. I think a lot of the clerks around the state are having issues with judges refusing to electronically sign and only want to sign a paper. Right. And that's what slows the whole process down. That's one issue. So how feasible is it at this point <laughs> to adopt a rule that says they must electronically sign? If it's what applicable. Is, but what does applicable mean? Meaning that the judge, just, believe me, I know how to say it. that's not applicable to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, okay. <laughs> Maybe applicable is not the right word, but applicable will mean if there's if or she can say if the court has the ability to sign documents electronically, they they must. Um, send it to the clerk that way, okay. because um, and I, and I say that uh, as it relates to the it, it should come from the clerk, because if if um if it goes and for some reason with human error uh, it doesn't it doesn't go on the docket then we don't know that that's actually true, 
And so, and if an attorney doesn't sign it, or if an, if, if an attorney isn't receiving it, then that means the clerk's office has not done something. And those are kind of the things that will give us an alert that we have missed a step, or we may have erred and not entered, a, entered a, uh, an order onto the docket as required. And so that's why it, it, it has to come from the clerk, <clears throat> excuse me, it has to come from the clerk to the, to the litigants and versus uh, it should go from the judge to the clerk and from the clerks to, um, to, the, um, to the litigants possibly. And, and if the judge is gonna sign electronically and it goes out anyway, we can just say, this is a courtesy copy, not a conformed copy. You will be receiving, or it could be a message. You will be receiving the conformed copy from the clerk's office. My kids, I Carlos and, and and Todd, have a sense of what the issue is, and sounds like narrowing in on a solution. I'm going to let the committee chew on this a while and and come back at the next meeting because I think y'all have some other issues you want to bring up before us. Um, we we do, and I think this is just an in, a good indication of you know of the fact that we have made progress uh, on what are. It's really, as you can all see from the discussion, it's, it's a complex issue. There's a lot of moving parts. And so we were fortunate to have John and Tracy and some other clerk, Laura, and some other clerk folks, uh, Velva, on our subcommittee who can well represent those concerns. Uh, and then we have uh, Judge Ferguson and uh, some others representing the judicial side. And so I think we're we're definitely moving things in the right direction. It's good to get this input and feedback. And uh, I think we can just come back and report. We'll meet again, uh, hopefully more than once to kind of hammer some of this stuff out. And then we'll come back and report at the next meeting. And Todd, I agree with that. I would say, I think uh, Judge Canales has his hand raised. And so he may would love to get some feedback, especially from a jurisdiction like Bear County, where you have, you don't have central courts, but you have, uh, you know, the way individual courts, but central courts. And that's part of why I had my hand up. Naturally, we've got a, a unique uh, system of doing things. And, and, and I think I heard someone mention about judges that don't want to participate in electronically filing uh, orders. There are some of us that do, but we don't necessarily have the systems in place that we would like to have uh, that enable us to do this in a way that would you know, comply with the rules. So one of my concerns, right, is one, and, and Certainly, I know the question is poised to you, Justice Boyd, but whatever what I've seen out of, you know, our appellate courts and our Supreme Court when they're interpreting rules, it's words mean and mean intently, right? So when it says the court, you know, it almost squarely will say that's the judge, that's the judge, and that shouldn't be pawned off to somebody else. And so my concern would be adding a sort of ministerial or not ministerial, clerical duty to me, if you will, when I don't have the uh, ability with the resources and the equipment and the software I have available to me to be able to do that, which is outside of my control, right? I don't get to write the checkbook or write the check or exercise uh, 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 usage of the funds that the commissioners get to do, right? And so I'm not necessarily squall, you know, you know, kind of complaining about that, but quite frankly, uh, I don't have the ability to say, you need to do this, provide me the software uh, unless I'm mandated to, I suppose maybe that's a, that's a solution in, in terms of, finding some sort of centralized system that we could all be required to use. But absent that, um, if somebody, you know, if, if I'm going to be required by this rule where it says the court shall and will or must do X, Y, Z, but I don't have the, the ability to do that uh, as freely or as easily as some of y'all do. And quite frankly, in our jurisdiction, right, we've got clerks that are assigned to our course, but we don't have on our, on the civil side anyway, we don't have coordinators, if you will, then, it's going to make, you know, I'm going to be put in a spot of almost a necessary failure because I, I may not be able to comply with that as easily as it may seem, even though I am in a bigger jurisdiction that should have those, those, those sort of resources available. So I just, you know, those were a couple of the comments I just wanted to make because it's not something that, you know, if you were to mandate and order me to, 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 to provide notice to, to somebody that I signed an order, um, I don't know how that would look like. I can tell you right now, I do sign documents uh, electronically through, I think we've got Adobe sign. And even within Adobe sign here locally, we've got issues with us being able to log in and all kinds of technical issues we haven't worked through that, that I've tried to work through. Uh, but notwithstanding the fact that again, that's kind of our issue, 
it is our issue. And if then I'm required to find a way to, to have to find a way to comply with what I'm being told to do by this rule, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do it. And that's kind of frankly concerning to me because I, I would, I certainly am one that wants to be able to electronically file orders. I want, I don't, uh, I want people to have immediate notice that an order of mine was filed or any document I signed was filed. Uh, but if the onus is put on me uh, right now, again, I don't have the resources to do it. And two, if I did, I'm kind of frankly concerned too, right? What if uh, down the line, someone tries to argue, uh, I didn't get notice of that. And then it becomes judge. Who did you, who did you make sure this order got sent to? Um, and, and so there's kind of more practical concerns, I think that we need to kind of consider when it comes to, you know, how this actually gets put into effect, especially when you're adding, uh, additional duties like this to, to the, to, it says again, the court, but to me, everything I've seen in, in cases, when the word court is used, it means the judge. It doesn't mean the judge's clerk because, uh, the, the, or the judge's coordinator, because in cases where those issues come up, <laughs> they'll say, you know, there's parts in the rule where it says clerk. And so if it didn't say clerk, it doesn't say clerk. And there's parts in the rule that say X, Y, Z. And if that's not what this says, then let's read and what it says. And if it says a court, the court is a court. So just a couple of thoughts of mine. And Judge Canales, if I, if I may, uh, you all don't have court coordinators because you have um, central dockets. Is that the reason you don't? That's correct. Okay. Do you all have a court manager? The short answer is yes. The long answer is it's not a court manager, probably in the in the sort of interpretation that most people here would have of, of what a court manager would be. Okay, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Judge. Anything sure. else before we move on? Okay, Carlos or Tom. Hey, thank you very much. Well, we got lots of work to continue doing at subcommittee level. Right. Okay, Casey, what's next? So, so under new business, I've got uh, two items from last time, which which uh, we've got little progress on that we'll make between now and the next meeting. The first one was the automated certificate of service. As Terry mentioned in cycle two, um, once that is complete, we will have the ability to turn off automated certificate of service by filing type, not that we need it, because I know that there was some discussion that still needs to go on, because I know Blake uh, and some others were of the opinion of we don't need to be turning that off for anything, uh, whereas some of the clerk's offices were saying we do need to turn it off for some mm -hmm. things, and so I think- As well as judges. As well as some judges. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's still discussion, Bob, that needs to be had with that particular um, I don't okay. know, but the capabilities there. But the technical capability. So if the committee <laughs> says we recommend it, and the Supreme Court says OCA do it, then I'm not in a position to say, well, we got to wait nine months. I can <laughs> make it happen very quickly. So, um, okay. I, well, I think the problem with that is if attorneys file their proposed orders that we were talking about in the order subcommittee. Um, as a single standalone document. Right. Because that's when yeah. and we were talking about we were talking about that in the committee as right. well. So if there's a way to get around that or turn it off for those document types, something to that effect is is what will solve the issue. Yeah. So we're we're pursuing the technical options on the back end so that it's an option on the table. Okay. Um, then on the sealed documents at our last meeting, Justice Simmons asked a very valid question of what do the feds do with sealed documents going through? And um, we're still looking at that and trying to answer what that question is from a federal level and how they do um, through their ECF CMS system. You'll, you may recall that the feds are a little bit more centralized than we are. So there's one e-filing system and one case management system. And I do know that they file sealed things through that but there's a, there appears to be a process to it. It's not just as simple as here's this document and it's sealed. There's a rigmarole to it. Um, I so, can tell you, I just spent a week filing a sealed document in a bankruptcy case where we were going back and forth. Several calls with the clerk's office because we had to get a specific order specifically. I, just like our Rule 76A, it turned out. You know, you know, it's 
specific order before you could then use the functions to file this document under seal. So you had to get permission to electronically, you had to file a motion to get permission to file the sealed document electronically. Yep. And was that motion to file a sealed document electronically electronic? Yes. So it's Fortunately, like the other side was unopposed because it was their confidential document. You know, so, but still it was kind of ridiculous. So it sounds like that's what the, the that's kind of what I was reading what the federal government does too, so. Now that there, even though it's centralized, there is some differences across different courts in the federal system in, in terms of that. And so uh, my paralegal indicated some of this had to do with a particular judge that was involved and so forth. And so there's, it is centralized. There a lot of it's uniform, but there is some variation. In the Nuance implemented differently at each of the different federal courts. Yep. Well, I, my only advisement, and this is just coming from an IT standpoint, is that whatever direction that we go on allowing sealed documents to be put in e-filing, let's make it the same for everybody. I can tell you in the state system, I won't tell you which lawyer did this, but a workaround was found to file the Rule 76A motion with the confidential document attached so the judge could actually see what they were being asked to. Even though the rules seal. say you can't well, do let me finish the story. Okay. <laughs> um, that lawyer determined that, you know, if I mark this as a sensitive document, then it's not, it's, and I'm still protecting its confidentiality. It gets into the file, the judge can then look at it and then. Uh, grant the motion for temporary sealing, sign the order temporarily sealing it, and then it gets filed as a sealed document. Off of that 76 a motion? Right, using the sensitive data process instead of the sealing. So with that, Bob, I believe at our last meeting, we did identify a subcommittee, and I'll get them together for okay. now the next meeting to hash that out. Um, the nice thing from a technical standpoint, again, the mechanism exists. It is there. Um, Terry, correct me if I'm wrong. There are other states using filing sealed documents through Odyssey File and Serve today. So that correct. The, the mechanical part of how you would do that is already there and we would just need to turn it on. So again, uh, that's a, 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 a process change or potentially process changes. And then finally, under new business, um, I'm going to add, let me see if David here. Escamilla is still yeah. on. I'm here. Um, David brought up a, a, a point from a previous meeting. And David, I'll turn it over to you and let you talk um, about um, the potential for us to provide free document acts or recommend to the Supreme Court to tell OCA to provide free document access to, to research taxes. Um, to particular groups. So, David, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Casey. This really should be under old, under very old business. But very old uh, business. Some of you might recall um, prior to COVID that um, I, I think we had been in receipt of a couple to a few requests for free access um, to um, research uh, Texas. And a subcommittee was formed to look at, you know, any kind of issues that might come with that and possibly any recommendations. Uh, I think um, we certainly had one meeting. I think there was a second. I know John, you know, Bob, you were involved in that. Uh, John, I believe, too. And I think, Carlos, you might have been involved in, in that meeting. And, um, and what came out of that meeting was generally a... Uh, uh, an idea that uh, this could be acceptable, but what might be the limitations placed on it. And I had, uh, from my notes, I had four um, really key points, I call them recommendations that came from them, and I'll read them. One, free access would be acceptable, but only for governmental agencies and public universities and colleges, at least to start. Second, free access application would require uh, an application be required in the process citing the purposes. We want other purposes uh, for which that access to information be used. 
Third, of course, would be um, housekeeping and execution in compliance with an end user license agreement signed by the entity uh, and any restrictions that come with that. And then lastly, identification and registration of all users participating um, under the respective use agreements. And that's because you know what we foresaw, I think one of the applicants at least was a uh, a college and to be used with you know in in class and so the problem with or one of the problems with this is that the the actual users could be students that would change every semester and what you know our our system is that we'd have to have contact and required uh, regulation with, with with each individual user so that's a lot of work to be done and so that that work needs to be placed on the entity that's doing it and so that would all need to be required you know I, I seem to recall Casey I don't know if you had in your notes that Tyler was in included in that first you know that meeting but I don't recall you know I don't find it in my new notes that they were there but really Bob I kind of put this out as this is what the results were of our meetings and kind of asking any comments anyone would have and what the next step might be. Should we talk to Tyler before making a formal recommendation at a next meeting or uh, how would you like us to proceed? Well, go ahead. So um, currently legal aid offices are also, we do have free access at this time. Yeah. I just want to make sure that that doesn't uh, get excluded no. from any changes. No. So that, that still happens. And so and just for the from the technical ability and, and Terry again jump in if I'm wrong. What we've done with the legal aid access groups is, you know, we know their domain, the end of their domain. You know, it's always going to be at some their legal aid email address, and so we have the ability to tell Tyler, hey, if a user comes into research and they're using this email address, don't charge them for documents, and that's how we run legal aid. So we could definitely do something like this on a domain based thing to where if it's, you know, at law.ttu.edu or law.unt.edu, then we let them have access um, to research. I like um, from the last meeting when we talked about an application required, you know, a very short form that that we can give either to a subcommittee at JCIT or JCIT whole saying, you know, this group has applied, what is the voting members, yay or nay, and then having just a list of here are the people who we've given free access to. Um, when we talk about that agreement, I agree with number three of the, having the use of that, uh, what you can and can't do, and then also, in addition to number three, having either an expiration date or a time certain that we go and just review those so it comes back up. Hey, you remember we gave the... Texas Tech Law School, the ability, do we still want to do this? Is this agreement still within the purview of what we want? Well, and also, so now this is coming back to me, it seems like we have a good bit of discussion about quote unquote researchers mm -hmm. and their students and assistants and all of that. Why did go in and, and basically data mine right. what was in well, what was in, in, in research and their as I recall, system issues as well as security issues um, that, that <coughs> folks were concerned about. And then what criteria would we use to turn to grant access to one group, turn down another, if that on its surface they would they both look like they're asking for the same thing. Bob, I recall having that discussion and and i think that's why we limited it to you know at, at that point to to public universities and, and state agencies or local governments so at least put a little handle on it but it's a valid point the the one thing i would say is to make sure it's user specific and not just a generic username and password that can be used and sent around to a ton of people um, cause if you have that person's address and if they're still employed with that university or government agency, you can always expire, set it up to where right. you expire their password after 90 days. Right. And if they don't have that email anymore because they've been fired or whatever else or left, can't. then they can't use it. Anymore. Right. Yeah. Well, that's we'll, get this, we'll get the group together again right. between now and our next meeting, which by the way, is, will be May the 13th. Yes. That sounds great. Come back with, with, with some recommendations. 
uh, and a little, a little more detail on how we address some of this. Casey, anything else under old or older business? <clears throat> that's, a, that's all I've got under new, old, oldest business. Okay, anything, anybody else? Anybody else unmute? Yeah, I have something. Yes, David. I worked on the um, specs for this two or three, four years back. One of the things I was asking for was to allow the attorneys to fill in their civil process requests within the e file system versus yes. attaching a separate document. <laughs> right. Where are we on that? So, um, Terry, you can unmute and if you, if you need to. My understanding is that that's included in phase two because we're already starting to work on requirements for, for process and putting the citation together. So, so when we, might that, so what I would envision would be they would request it. So I'm filing a lawsuit. And, and you, you say I need to have process and on. Once, it's, once, once the filing is accepted, <clears throat> the process is issued back automatically to the file without really, I mean, the court right. would review the process request as part of the entirety of the review because it's my understanding right now they take the civil process request form and they enter it in and they print something off or and they, they email it or whatever it's kind, of, it's kind of a complicated system yes i believe we're the the group that we've got working together and actually i'm going to tell my project manager to involve you on it as well for you to make sure your use case is covered because i'm pretty sure it already is but that's the route that we're going so that Whenever you file a new case, it's kind of automatic because you right. need that kind of process of service so that we can collect all that information up front rather than have it travel on a document yes, and then go know who knows Justice, where after that. One of Justice Floyd's concerns from prior conversations regarding his social media posting is keeping down costs. We, we spend money or our clients spend money with us every single day going to a remote courthouse in Texas to pick up process. And hundreds of dollars a day. And we're just a tiny, I mean, you've got collectively just as void thousands and thousands of dollars a day wasted in the system of couriers and notaries and process servers going to different courts across the state to pick up physical process where Harris County and all the all the major counties now pretty much you just with electronic email it to you and let you do your thing from there. Do they have to email it to you or can you access it? Right now, I, I think it varies county by county. Some counties where we can access it online, some mm -hmm. counties we can't. Right. And I think that and the, some of those in the second category, they will email it to you and others you've got to well what they generally do is some counties will email to us directly. Mm -hmm. uh, Travis, I know, has done that for years, I believe. Harris County does not. Is that correct? You email it back to the requester? Back to the requester. Yes. And then they email it to us. Having, having the ability to go on and say, I want to serve Casey Kennedy, and they could load their list of process servers, send this to David Wilms, that'd be beautiful. That's, that's a big ask. But, right. but the request online, I mean, it just, as I say, we... There's millions of dollars a year wasted in sending people pick up physical processes. Okay, well, Casey, you've got a group working on this. Right? We have a, yeah, okay. I, I, we've got a group at OCA working on it, but I'll make sure that you're included okay. in that group for the, because we're we're just starting up the use case for that particular feature. Thank you. Okay, anything else? If not, thanks everybody for your work and your efforts on, on behalf of. JCIT in the state court system, and we have a safe trip back for those of you that are here in person. Thank you to all of you who joined us virtually, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.